Hi, this is Catherine Marr. And this is Jillian York. And welcome back to Entire Bag. We wanted to get started today with a topic that has been in the news quite a lot over the course of the past couple of weeks, which is Russia and some of the actions that it has been taking on the political scene. But we wanted to focus instead of Crimea and what's been going on there at something that's a little bit closer to home in the Kremlin, which is media censorship and control of the internet within Russia. Yeah, so um, what we know historically is that Russia has... Um, been a censor of the internet for a couple of years now. In 2012, they passed a law um, that would allow for a blacklisting of certain websites and have been blocking um, sites since, I think, around mid-2013 is when th that, uh, that bill actually went into effect. Um, but more recently, particularly with the run-up to the Olympics, um, there has been an increase in censorship. And so, I don't know, Catherine, where we want to start, but I, I know that there was this one New York Times article that I found absolutely fascinating and that kind of caused us to both dig into this story a bit more. Yeah. So uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? You told me that you caught this and I love it <laughs> because you were actually reading an old, uh, a dead tree copy of the New York Times. It's true. Um, it was that days. It wasn't old, but it was dead tree. Um, <laughs> I, and not only was I reading it, but I was reading it um, in Myanmar because my internet was really slow. So I was getting all my news from actual paper, which if you know me is sort of an anomaly. Um, and so there was this page that jumped out at me because of its fantastic graphic, and we'll throw up this link so that everyone else can see the, the wonderful accompanying illustration. Um, but it was called The Kremlin Social Media Takeover. Um, and it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. The New York Times covered it, and so did The Verge. Um, but this, the short version of the story, and we'll, we'll dig into it a little bit more as we um, get into what this means, um, is that a popular uh, social network, V Contacta, um, which has been dubbed Russia's Facebook, um, the largest independent medium in Russia, um, has been kind of taken over, uh, so to speak. And so basically the founder, uh, Pavel Durov, who's been described as a staunch libertarian um, and is actually now the founder of this new app that everybody is talking about called Telegram, which is supposed to be um, a more secure version of, uh, say, like WhatsApp or tools like that. Um, basically, Durov um, had been pressured for quite some time to step down. His home was raided um, in April 2013 on trumped up charges. Um, and now, um, as the story goes, he has been pressured and did effectively sell his, um, I think he had 12% share in the company, um, to, let me just get this name right, uh, Ivan Tavrin, a partner of the pro-Putin oligarch, uh, wow, I'm having a really hard time saying that sentence. You wanna, you wanna jump in, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> sure no problem so he there we had go. <laughs> sorry <laughs> a, so he he is has sold his 12 percent stake in the company that was remaining um after he had been after a sale last there year by two of his other co-founders of their own um 48 percent stake to something called united capital partners mm -hmm. um which was it's an investment firm that's managed by Ilya Sherbovich, which is a an ally of president putin and what that left durov was with was 12 percent of the company and then um control over a, another 40 percent stake that was managed by a company uh, by the email provider mail.ru um but which is also a company that is seen as being fairly closely aligned with putin and so what we know has happened is that um, over the course of time that he, he apparently one of these reports, and I don't remember if it was the verge, it was the report in the verge website or the report on the New York times said that he received an unambiguous signal that it was time to sell. And he resurfaced a week before the, uh, Olympics and announced that he was going to sell his 12% stake and, and actually leave, leave Russia. Right, right. And so in the New York times piece, um, he's described as, as sort of the hero of the, millennial generation in Russia who, uh, you know, apparently grew up using this platform in the same way that we might say we sort of grew up a little bit older than that, but grew up using Facebook. Um, and so basically now he's leaving Russia, has started this new startup called Telegram, um, which I think TechCrunch described as um, wanting to be NSA proof, the most NSA proof messaging app in the world. I wouldn't say it necessarily is at the moment. I, have, I don't know anyone that's looked at it carefully. Um, but nonetheless, um, really fascinating story and kind of telling, um, given what happened after that. And maybe we should talk about that a little bit as well. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think 
I guess we jumped right into talking a little bit about Vicontacto without actually giving um, a tremendous amount of background. One of the really interesting things about Vicontacto is that so it, it was actually created um, by Durov, who ran a, uh, I think it was at the time when he was in college, a really popular sort of online forum for college students across, across Russian-speaking college students, you know, not I guess that would mean include people outside of Russia who perhaps wanted to participate. And he, one of his co-founders had been at university at Tufts uh, in the United States and seen the promise of what, or what he saw as the promise of Facebook and came back to Russia and said, effectively, like, hey, man, do you want to work <laughs> with me on something quite similar? And the two of them coded up uh, Vicontacto, which is now, I mean, incredibly popular. To give a, a sense of how popular it is among Russian language speakers, it gets about in July 20. 13, which are sort of the latest statistics I was able to find, they had 50 million unique daily visitors. Wow. Um, by comparison, Facebook only gets 7.8 million unique visitors per day. What? So even the yeah, right? That's so incredible. Even though, even though Facebook is wildly, wildly popular and is, I think, in, in fact, a larger social network, um, the frequency and intensity of users for Vcontacta is, is apparently higher by an order of magnitude. So... Um, and for a long time, it was seen as a really sort of permissive space, maybe not for necessarily political speech, but, um, you know, piracy and, and other sort of things uh, that were sort of outside the bounds of legal regulation in the way that a place like Facebook, which is, Jillian will be the first to tell you, very tightly regulated um, with regards to speech. So, uh, so there was this incredibly sort of a liberal and open space. It was uh, widely adopted by Russian um, speaking users around the world. It's, it's certainly not just Russia, the many of the former um Soviet states that make up the CIS, uh, this is where you'll find young people. So, um, you know, when this is this is not just big news because it's a Russian social network, but it is big news because this is probably one of the only significant sort of social networks out there outside of Facebook. Right, right. And so, I mean, it, there are all of these different factors when you put them all together, thinking back to 2006 when Vicontacta started, um, over the past few years, a number of factors why the Russian government would you know, deign to crack down on social media, given the, the rest of the political scene. And so, like I mentioned before, 2012, the Duma um, approved this internet regulation bill that would um, allow for the blacklisting of sites. Those went into, that went into effect um, in March 2013. Um, and basically these were, you know, gave the power to block any internet content that was deemed illegal or harmful to children. Now, those are both pretty vague um, definitions, um, particularly harmful to children, which you could argue most things, many things um, are, you know, do fall into that category. Yeah, this is usually what is known as the the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the internet, yes. right? So harmful <laughs> to children, <laughs> pornographic, terrorism, and um, I think probably like insulting to religion. Yep. Is, is the yep. Yep. <laughs> hate speech. Yeah, hate speech. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so this, you know, just made it a lot easier. Um, and, you know, Facebook to also so Facebook, which does have quite a few Russian users, um, has been complying with Russian legal orders, as far as I can tell, as well. Um, and so, and, and this is really interesting because Vcontacta has a history of thumbing its nose at the authorities. Oh, yeah, what was that fantastic description? Um, hold on, I I have to read that. So. Um, Dorov, the the founder of Vicontacta, there was a great uh, thing where he basically got a um, so Vicontacta received presidential calls from the prosecutor's office and the FSB requesting that it shut down an anti-Putin online group called United Russia, the party of crooks and thieves, and then he replied to the summons um, to the prosecutor's office with a picture of a husky dressed in a hoodie and sticking out its tongue. I've seen the picture. The dog is very cute. <laughs> It's just amazing. Um, and so, so anyway, um, so speaking of thumbing their nose up, so what has happened now is that, so there, there's all of this talk about surveillance during the, um, during the Sochi Olympics recently. And, uh, you know, Catherine, and I talked about that a little bit last time, I think, but there's not much that we can put a finger on. There hasn't been much, um, kind of brought out for evidence, but, uh, shortly after that, so around March 12th, 13th, um, Russia began blocking access to major independent news sites. That's right. So uh, we know that some of the major independent news sites, including people who are known for being sort of anti-Putin for a variety of reasons. So there's uh, Alexei Navalny, who um, runs a really, really popular blog on, on the website LiveJournal, which LiveJournal 
was once a very popular blogging platform in the West. It still is the primary blogging platform for Russian language speakers. Uh, Gary Kasparov, who uh, is known as a, um, you know, a, a dissident activist and um, the online newspaper Grani and Echo Moscovy, which is a uh, online site for actually a, a, a major radio station, which is owned, majority owned by, by Gazprom. Um, by Gazprom, yeah. exactly. Um so all of those different sites were blocked over the course of the week of March 13th, uh, essentially overnight, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. and the um, the prosecutor general actually published a list of the prohibited sites, so there was a, a small amount of transparency around this. We're going to get more into the discussion of transparent censorship when we talk about Turkey later. Um, but there was a little bit of transparency around this, and it said that the news sites had been entered into the single register of banned information after calls for participation in unauthorized rallies. So if there were a fifth horseman, it would probably be calling for uh, protest. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And those protests were actually um, around what was going on in the Ukraine. If um, it w I think this is really important to clarify. This actually has nothing to do with Russia being in the news more recently with regards to its annexation of Crimea. But this has to do with when there were protests in downtown Kiev um, and there was the unrest that was going on there. Uh, there were, a, I guess, conversations that were happening about what you know an appropriate response in Russia might be and talk of... Of, you know, solidarity protests and the like. And, and that that's really where this came into effect. Right. Right. So that brings us to, well, I think that brings us to just talking about what, what does this mean for Russia? What's going to happen next? Um, you know, is this going to be opposed? Will it just kind of go down quietly? Um, and well, so one of the really interesting things about Russia is that sites pop on and off the blacklist all the time. This is not uh, something where we see sites that go on and then are on for really extended periods of time. In my experience, and, and Jillian, I'm sure you've seen this too, uh, some of these opposition sites and, and sort of dissident sites will come on and then they'll come off and, and be unblocked again just as quickly as they went on. So it's like the, the Russian government seems to really use this as an example of just-in-time blocking uh, around politically sensitive events. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, this is something that, this is kind of a practice that was um, started by Iran. Iran used to do this all the time, kind of take, take sites down when they thought that they would be a real threat during periods of protest or elections and put them back up. Um, and yeah, like Catherine said, this is what we kind of refer to as just in time censorship. And it seems like this is um, Russia's tactic these days as well. Um, yeah, yeah, there was a yeah, but I think you're right. I mean, there, there is sort of this question now, Russia seems to be flexing its muscle on the international stage and in, increasingly aggressively. We've seen, um, obviously, what's happened in Crimea. And, you know, now I just this morning, I was reading an article making sort of the assertion that is, is, is Crimea going to be the end of this? Or is this going to go and spill into other countries, other former Soviet states? Should should Moldova be concerned, for example? Um, and if Russia is going to continue some of its expansionist uh, tendencies, which are, you know, certainly within the international community, um, pretty strongly condemned. Mm -hmm. Is this something that where censorship is going to become an increasingly popular and not popular, uh, an increasingly increasingly part of the toolkit for the Russia for the Kremlin and and for Russia's political um, political power structure? Yeah, no, absolutely, um, and I do think that. Um, I do think that there's a chance that this will go much further. I mean, I think that's a chance with a lot of the countries that we're going to be talking about today. So I guess the question then is, what do what do the people think of this? Um, and what, you know, what does that mean? Well, so it timely, isn't it? <laughs> um, there, are, <laughs> I, I see what you did there. Um, that's what I was trying so, to do before, but you jumped in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can't um, take a cue so, this one. I can't. Oh. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> well, when there's an opportunity to pontificate about what Russia might do next. Um, so I usually run and hide in the corner when that opportunity arises, just for the record. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I think what Jillian was trying to bring up is the fact that the Pew Research Center, which is known for its really fantastic sort of polling and research data from around the world, recently released a study, uh, or a report rather, um, just at the beginning of this week, if I'm not mistaken, on the future of the internet in middle income and, and lower income countries. Yep. Yeah, the report came out on March 18th, um, and it basically, a big headline, emerging and developing nations want freedom on the internet. Um, and it looked at a, a number of countries from Uganda, Ghana, El Salvador, South Africa, Mexico, Egypt, Lebanon, et cetera, et cetera, including Russia. 
Um, and we'll talk about some of the other countries as well later. But Russia, um, the statistic was particularly interesting in that eight in 10 Russian adults under the age of 30. So really the core millennial generation. Um, the users of e-contact. Exactly. Um, want freedom. Those folks want freedom online. Um, and now, like, just to get, just to clarify what Freedom Online means in this definition, I feel like we should look a little bit closer and see, you know, exactly how far these folks are willing to go. Um, do you, do you know the answer to that offhand? Um, so it's, yeah, what I've, what I've seen, and I haven't had the chance to read the report in, as, in it, in, in its entirety, is that among Russians as a whole, it's, as Jillian said, 80% of people under the age of 30 believe that the internet should be uncensored. Um, it's not actually really clear what censorship means. I don't have a definition of it in front of me. Uh, I would imagine that it probably does actually, if you were to look at the language, and Jillian, I don't know if you're pulling it up. Yep. Um, does it say anything about whether or not those four horsemen of the apocalypse uh, that the <laughs> the censorship for chill for protection of children uh, terrorism um, hate speech and and um, and the like are those no, sort so of carved out fascinatingly the question was very loosely worded and I, I can't believe that this is really a two page document I'm sort of puzzled by um, what I'm finding at Pew but basically the question was how important is it to you that people have access to the internet without government censorship mm -hmm. and then asked on a, a five point scale from very important to not important at all. Oh, okay. So, uh, so yeah, I guess that is, that is pretty unclear because in my experience, and certainly I'm sure you've seen this too, Jillian, is that when you actually ask somebody what censorship means, you get an really broad definitions it's of what, true. what someone would think of as a censored internet versus an uncensored and internet. And it can go in any direction, by the way, because I've gotten into serious debates with Egyptians about incitement and they're like, no, 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 it's fine. Like, no, that should not be illegal. And you're like, wait a minute, but okay, I... Uh, yeah. And my First right. Amendment gets all haywired in my brain. Um. <laughs> Whereas I've had conversations with individuals who are fully for, you know, um, a free and open Internet, but yet believe that any sort of incitement whatsoever should be taken down and would not consider that censorship. So, yeah, uh, yeah this is a, this is pretty broadly word, worded. And so while it is interesting and eye catching in terms of the overall numbers, it's not necessarily really indicative of any sort of deeper truth. Um, at least that would be my take. No, but you know, what is interesting is the gap. Um, I, I, mean, I would agree with you. What is really interesting is the gap in age ranges. So 18 to 29 year olds, um, like Catherine said, 80% say an uncensored internet's important to them. 72% of Russians, 30 to 49 say that. But then when you get older, over 50, only 44% of Russians say that. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm guessing, of course, that making, I, I'm going to go ahead and make the assumption that internet usage is correlated to age in Russia, um, as it is in many countries. Um, but nonetheless, um, you know, I mean, I think that we are seeing a huge shift in opinion amongst our own Absolutely. generation. And I mean, I think that, you know, some of that is structural and, and there's been literally entire books written on the subject, but a huge part of that mm -hmm. does come out of the internet that you experience, right? And so oh, for sure. it's very interesting to me that um, the users of this social network, the Contacto, which has this really, or historically had this very freewheeling sort of um, rep reputation that was led by somebody who sort of aggressively styled themselves as a libertarian um, and, you know, thumbed his nose at, at authority, it, it's it actually, it, there's sort of a structural reinforcement there of perhaps some of these attitudes. Absolutely. Um, so, so let's talking about censorship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I really, I want to talk more about the poll, but I want to talk about a few other countries first. So yeah, talking about censorship, um, what, what part of the world would you like to travel to next, Catherine? Well, I mean, I think I think that what we can <laughs> let's talk a little bit about Syria because a study came out uh, just this uh, past month on a massive dump of data from 2011 uh, from Syrian censorship. Now, did you have the chance to take a look at this? In fact, actually, I know you did because you were quoted in some of the articles talking Was about I? it. Was oh, I? You were. <laughs> That's not helpful. Um, well, I didn't. I did not have a chance to take a look at this particular article that you have sent me here um, from the MIT Technology Review, which we'll, we'll link to this for for our uh, viewers. But um, yeah, so so I can talk about sure, it. Sure. Yeah. Why don't Why don't you jump into it, and then I guess I will um, try to remember what I told the media. <laughs> so back in, to, in October 2011, um, a hacker group called uh, Telecomics uh, was able to get their hands on 600 gigabytes of data from the Syrian mm. government's uh, web censorship apparatus. And that 
entire data set represented something like 750 million requests, internet requests, not not censorship, not blo- like reports of blocking, but just ordinary web users' um, traffic over the course of, of the time period that they had available. And that was dumped in 2011, and just over the course of the past month, um, so I think it was, yeah, in February, there was a report released in a open source academic journal actually in analyzing all of this. And what it found was that um, it, over the time frame that these researchers looked at, only 1% of the Syrian internet was actually censored at any given time. Right. This is really interesting. And I'm looking at this report. Sorry, I got I got a little distracted there because I found several errors in this uh, article. But oh, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> It's true. Well, so they they claim that um, Syria uncensored Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube in February 2011, fearing the possibility of unrest if they censored it wholesale. And that's not, first off, Twitter was never censored. And second, that's not why they uncensored it. But anyway, um, I digress. I digress. So 1%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is, I mean, this is not surprising to me. So I believe that that is what I I ended up, um, because I I think I made the journalist feed me the information before I responded to it, probably. That's the lazy person's uh, media call. But yeah, so I mean, censorship based on four main criteria. So URL-based filtering, keyword filtering, destination IP address, and a custom category-based censorship, which is indicative of using commercial filtering software. Um, That doesn't surprise me at all. I think that it's what happened after 2011 that's more surprising. Um, I'm presuming you are referring to the investment in additional censorship technology? Yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, we know that Syria, you know, tried to purchase um, blue coat devices, but apart from... When, what are blue coat devices? Uh, deep pack- well, so uh, devices that... <laughs> Put me on the spot, Catherine. Um. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I just, one of the comments that we've gotten from, from people who've watched the show is that sometimes we talk about things and we don't explain no, what no, they are. No, no, you're totally so. right. You're totally right. Um, so it was um, the, oh, wait a minute. So this data actually came from the Blue Coat device. Well, then I'm wrong. Um, and I feel like you want to you wanna explain that one? Because I didn't realize that this report actually referred to them in 2011. And now I'm feeling a little... Okay, no, it's not. <laughs> so uh, Blue Code is a company that sells filtering and, and network management uh, services that can be used for very legitimate reasons. Say you run a um, financial services company, you want to be able to intercept your encrypted traffic to make sure that people aren't engaging in insider trading. That is totally legitimate within your rights and, in fact, how you comply with a whole number of regulatory uh, restrictions and laws that are designed to keep the global economy safe and sound. Um, But if you are a government, you would use that to break into people's encrypted traffic and get a sense of what it is that they're actually looking at. Um, But in this particular instance, what the blue code devices were being used for is to provide um, filtering based on keywords and censorship and blocking of certain um, unique, uh, yeah, five unique keywords, essentially. And those keywords that are mentioned by this report, and, and I haven't had the chance again to read the whole thing, are things like uh, proxies that would allow people to evade that censorship. Um, anything related to the state of Israel, which is sort of fascinating that Syria was focused on that at the time. Well, so, um, but I gotta say, this isn't new. So one of the, mm. one of the annoying things about this article is that um, the authors, or the, the authors of the study claim that, to the best of their knowledge, this is the first look into internet filtering in Syria, but in fact, I was involved in research into internet filtering in Syria in 2000 2009 um, with the Open Net Initiative, and we had already found all of this. So we already knew that um, Israeli that that um, the .il domain was not entirely blocked, um, mm-hmm. but that uh, not on every ISP, rather, but on most some ISPs, the entire domain was blocked. Um, key u- URLs using the keyword Israel were also found to be blocked. So a news article that happened to mention Israel in the title and the headline, you know, if it was in the URL, that would be blocked. Um, as well as that a lot of pan-Arab newspapers were blocked, um, stuff like that. Well, so, so this is not I new think what, data. No, it's not. But what well, it's it's not new information. It is new data. Okay, yeah, so the, sorry, point, it's not... the point that the article is making is not that it's yeah, the yeah. first time that we've had insight into what's going on with regards to Syrian censor- censorship. Excuse me. It's the first time that, to anyone's knowledge, we have a dump of data from government 
censorship apparatus to be able to actually analyze it um, from the perspective of those that are within the government, as opposed to having to do the sort of research that is that's required that you did it in your work, which is looking at it by saying, "All right, what do we know is being blocked because we can't access yeah, no, it?" No, no, this no. actually I, shows us I agree with the you. inverse of that. I agree with you. That's just not their claim. Their claim is that it's the first look into fil- internet filtering. The paper states oh. that right in the uh, synopsis. So, <laughs> oh, well, okay. I mean, I, I saw some perhaps more nuanced coverage of it in, in another location then. So what the reason I wanted to bring this up, though, is because it taught like this is if less than 1% of the internet is being filtered, it shows how, you know, even in a country where, mm-hmm. um, where the sort of political discourse is tightly controlled, 99% of content is still available. And it really shows sort of the, the level of focus within these, within these sort of authoritarian regimes on what it is specifically that they're concerned that their citizens, um, not have access to. And, and the reason that this is interesting is after talking a little bit about Russia, we're going to talk next about Turkey, where, um, a very, very broad approach has been taken to filtering in recent days. Yeah, but just to stick on to just to stick on that last point that you made, that's actually an excellent point um, about the, you know, the percentage of content that's filtered. I mean, so there's two factors that I would think of here. Um, one is the percentage of Arabic content that's filtered. Um, so we know that historically, a lot of governments in the Arab world have um, gone after Arabic content more stringently than they have English content. Um, and mm-hmm. even to this day, if you I've seen some quotes recently from our friend uh, Lena Talla in Egypt, who runs uh, the popular publication Metamasser in English, um, that you're still more able to evade authorities by writing in English. So that's still a thing that they just, a lot of countries still don't have the monitoring capability for English language content that they do for Arabic content. Um, But then the other thing that I was going to mention is, yeah, just how that, it's so true how how few websites one needs to block to block an entire topic area though too um so if you look at like pakistani censorship um around uh, balochistan or moroccan censorship around the western sahara these are countries that don't you know i mean just like syria don't block a whole lot of content one of the funny things about syria is that it never really bothered to block pornography um (laughs) <laughs> Which, I mean, is kind of funny when you think about it. Myanmar apparently is the same thing I just learned. Um, so, you know, authoritarian countries that kind of keep certain things open, um, you know, as kind of... Bread, bread and circuses? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Good description. Exactly. <laughs> so... Um, so anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, I find that I find that really interesting. I'm also sort of annoyed with these paper authors at the moment and thinking about, hmm, how do I get in touch with them? But uh, but yeah, no. So I mean, I think this is it is really good research, nonetheless. Um, <laughs> just like it's not well, shocking that Israel's blocked. We've known that for years. <laughs> you just know, yes, but you are unfortunately an expert in this, whereas many people are not. So. Fair enough. Well, clearly <laughs> these guys aren't if they never found the previous research. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I digress. So moving on to Turkey, as Catherine had brought up before, Turkey is another fascinating case. So this time, why don't we start with a little bit of the history before we jump into the current stuff? And let me just... Well, do you want to start with the history of the internet? Or perhaps we can talk a little bit about Turkey and political control writ large to contextualize it. Ah, okay. Well, why don't you start there while I dig up what I want to dig up on the internet? And then we can... Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Catherine, I mean, so I, Catherine spent a lot more time in Turkey and specifically with um, a lot of Turkey's political scene than I have. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually, right. I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your thoughts. No, no. I just spent a very cold winter last year in Ankara um, <laughs> <laughs> running around. Uh, that's right. So, so, I mean, Turkey in a nutshell, uh, you have the AKP party of which you have the um, prime minister, um, Tayyip Erdogan, who is the head of that party, who has led that party for um, over a very successful sort of um, resurgence of Turkey's economic and political clout in both the region and sort of on the international stage. Over the course of the of his leadership, um, since he's ascended to the prime ministership, what you've seen is a closing of the Turkish political sort of environment. Um, the opposition party, which was prior to the creation of the AKP, the sort of lead party in power for many, many years is is really sort of very brittle at the moment and, and unable to provide any sort of meaningful opposition to Erdogan's policies. And as that has 
um, become increasingly apparent that, that there is really so no significant opposition. Erdogan has been increasingly emboldened um, in his both sort of foreign policy and domestic policies and asserted control and crackdown on political opposition, arresting journalists. Turkey has the highest rate of incarceration for journalists in mm. the world, um, for example, really, uh, you know, applying approaches very similar to what we've actually just talked about in Russia, where there's extensive state ownership or state investment in various different media properties. Um, and over the course of the past couple of years, also taking an increasingly aggressive approach to the internet. Now, again, Turkey has, in addition to a weak opposition, it, it has also had a fairly weak sort of civil society opposition as well, not, you know, not just political. Um, and, and what does exist in terms of civil society tends to be actually very closely aligned with, uh, the AK party, um, uh, AK party's politics. It's really composed of like, educational groups and, and sort of groups that provide social services and the like, and, and nothing really that sort of comes close to resembling what we would expect out of a, a fair, a relatively robust and longstanding democracy, which, um, Turkey, depending on how you argue it, could could be considered to be. I mean, it certainly is a successful democracy in the sense that it has clean and fair elections. Um, the structures themselves that are in place are, are perhaps a little bit more questionable. So uh, that's sort of where Turkey is. My I tend to think of Turkey, and my favorite quote on on the current state of, of Turkey comes from actually the, the King of Jordan, who is an interesting one to comment yeah, on, on democratic policies, <laughs> um, who once re- compared democracy for Erdogan um, to like riding a public bus when it's his stop, he gets off. That sounds about right. Yeah. I mean, I think the New York Times recently described it as an authoritarian democracy. Um, I, I don't recall if that's the exact quote, but it sounds about right to me. Um, yeah. So, I mean, Catherine talked a little bit about the the media restrictions. It's true. Turkey ranked uh, 2013, they ranked 154 out of 166 on Reporters Without Borders Worldwide Press Freedom Index, um, which, I mean, you can question the methodology of that. But regardless, um, a ranking like that is not a good ranking. Um, since right, 19- that's right. And, and since, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, since 1992, 18 journalists have been murdered in the country, 14 with impunity. Um, journal, you know, uh, uh, journalists are repeatedly fined, detained, um, occasionally beaten. Um, so yeah, no, no, oh, the other great quote is the world's biggest prison for journalists, I think, um, for also from reporters that borders doesn't really um, give much hope. And so when it comes to the internet, What's interesting about Turkey is that they do have a pretty good, pretty monetizable um, population of internet users. Uh, So 45% of the population has regular access to the internet, and that's a 2012 statistic, so it's probably gotten even better, particularly with the proliferation of smartphones. Um, And the leading ISP, Turk Telecom, um, Catherine, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they they control the entire commercial background, backbone. And, I believe and right. also, yeah. I believe, all of the international traffic. So pretty uh, yeah. centralized control. Um, mm-hmm. And so Turkey, over the years, has been increasingly trying to um, control various types of content. 2007, they passed a law that would um, prohibit online content in eight different categories, most of which dealt with... Um, abuse to children or um, prostitution, things like that, facilitation of the abuse of drugs, but also crimes against Ataturk. Um, and mm, the, my favorite category. Yes, the crimes against Ataturk category is the one that has allowed Turkey to block YouTube. Um, and so YouTube was, I think YouTube was blocked from like 28 to 2010, and then again, again now, I no, it's not blocked, I don't know, it's blocked on and off in the same way that we talked about with Russia, but usually for pretty long periods. Um, and basically what will happen is the government will send a legal request to YouTube asking them to take down a certain type of content. YouTube will refuse, and then the government will block YouTube again. Um, a lot of sites, therefore, comply pr- pretty stringently with Turkish law, including Facebook, from what I can tell um, from the transparency report. But it's, I think it's really helpful to note that um, it is actually, in this case, really, really strict laws. Turkey, um, which is a par- which is not, a, excuse me, a, a parliamentary democracy mm-hmm. that has a, <laughs> um, it has a, it has a Senate. Um, uh, Turkey has really strict laws. In fact, just in at the very end of February last year, they passed another really aggressive new internet censorship law that um, criminalizes all sorts of different behaviors mm-hmm. and imposes new restrictions on people who, for example, operate internet cafes. Yep. So, uh, like, say, as you mentioned, YouTube, uh, Vimeo, which is another video site, SoundCloud, um, which is a popular audio sharing site, and and Pastebin, which is a document dump site, have all been blocked. Now, 
the reasons for why these particular sites have been blocked is is also very much tied up with um, with some of the sort of ongoing political mm-hmm. issues. Dillian, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, well, I wasn't there yet, but um, oh, <laughs> I was just going to say that, um, no, just a couple more fascinating facts. Uh, just the sheer number, since we were talking about this with Syria, I thought it would be worth mentioning, mentioning that um, last year there was a report that came out that said that an estimated 31,000 sites are blocked in Turkey. Um, wow. which, I mean, when you compare that, I, I can't recall what the number was for Syria and I've already closed that, um, that tab, but you compare that with like, um, other countries that censor the internet that have, you know, where, where studies have been done on the sheer number. And I think that that is pretty high, relatively speaking. Um, mm-hmm. I think the only number that I've seen higher is for Thailand, but that, that one's still pretty much an estimate. And also, um, I think that they've got cer- certain stricter controls as well. Um, so anyway, yeah, so we're getting to now. Um, and so what happened last year during the protests, um, the Gezi Park protests is that there were all sorts of, if if you'll recall, there were these (laughs) giant protests in downtown. No, it's fine. No, no, it's a good point. (laughs) And and really large protests in downtown Istanbul, ostensibly around the fact that, uh, again, the AK party under the leadership of Erdogan wanted to take one of Istanbul's only remaining green public spaces at a very small park um, and build a new shopping center in, in the middle of it. And this got immediately out of control. Um, There were, I mean, from, from the government (laughs) side, um they were you know shooting people with water cannons they were tear gassing people in the streets um cnn turk was showing a documentary on penguins in the middle of all of this um so that oh, yeah. speaks quite to a few the... people <laughs> yeah and quite a few fatalities yes. um throughout the protests yeah and, and really what i mean i know it, people it was referred to as the gezi park protest but what it really was very in, in large part about was that that particular neighborhood in which that park existed is a example of um dislocation and displacement if um, under that sort of in very much in line with the policies of the current government, right. which tends to favor economic development over some of um, preservation of some of the country's more eclectic um, history. So in that, that particular neighborhood that was that, that the, that the shopping mall would have gone in was known as being a, a sort of a neighborhood full of people who are lower income. Um, I think that there is a, a gay community um, and an element of Turkey of Turkey's gay community, Istanbul's gay community um, associated with that, that particular area. And so this is very much seen as, as sort of part of the, the, the petit bourgeois um, mm. sort of redevelopment of Turkey in its own image. I didn't know that last bit. That's really, that's fascinating. Um, yeah. So, so basically, so after those protests, um, Erdogan called social media, and I quote, the worst menace to society. So the menace (laughs) is not, you know, rampant capitalism. The menace is not people protesting in the streets. It's clearly social media. But to speak to the power of social media in Turkey, um, you know, a a couple things. I mean, one is there was this great article like the day before Turkey censored Twitter, which made me think she must be a spy, um, where our friend Zeynep Tefekci, a sociologist um, in the U.S., but who is also Turkish, um, talked about this and basically, you know, said media in the hands of citizens can rattle regimes. It makes it much harder for rulers to maintain legitimacy by controlling the public sphere. Um, And, you know, talked about how powerful um, Twitter is specifically by mentioning a a story about um, a young man, Burkan Elvan, who um, had just recently passed away. He was 15 years old and he'd been hit in the head by a tear gas canister uh, last year during those protests, spent 269 days in a coma. Um, And then his, I know, and then his family um, tweeted that they had lost their son and then tweeted the funeral date. A hundred thousand people showed up to the funeral and, and it turned into a mass demonstration. And with wow. violent clashes with authorities, with tear gas, um, against mourners. So, yeah. And so Twitter. Twitter. So what, what did Erdogan say then about Twitter? Well, so then, uh, wait, so there's one more thing. Cause right after, so that shows the power of it. And here's the other power of it on Twitter also, um, and on YouTube tweeted from things posted to YouTube, um, voice recordings of the prime minister were published. So of Erdogan were published on YouTube, popularized on Twitter. And those voice recordings, um, allegedly demonstrated corruption. Um, he was recorded speaking to his son by phone, um, referencing a plan by the pair to hide cash in several safe houses. 
Um, That's right. Yeah. So there, so that really is what has been said to be the trigger. But I, I mean, I think you can see that there's build up to it. Um, but that cl- that's there, clearly what put him over the edge and decided to block uh, or made him decide to block Twitter. Well, so there's a couple things from from what we've been hearing as well. Um, so there was that that leak of the of the voice recording. But even just last month, there was a. Um, uh, right around the same time that the the new internet censorship law was passed, mm. there were there was a leaked recording of a phone conversation that was supposed, supposedly between Erdogan and um, uh, a man named Fatih Sarak, or I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. And of my apologies, who's the deputy chairman of uh, the Jenner Media Group, which is a large right. Turkish Turkish conglomerate. Um, in and in that phone call, Erdogan sort of rebukes uh, Sarak for for having allowed for. Um, the political opposition to to air their remarks criticizing Erdogan on his television stations right. uh, owned by uh, owned by CMG on um, Haberturk, which is a large Turkish satellite television station, um, be, and that that criticism of the from the opposition party was related, in fact, to those Gezi Park protests. And so you've got Erdogan essentially dressing dressing down um, the owner of an independent media station, and I, I say independent, you know, in the, in the most loose of terms, it ultimately being the fact that it isn't state owned, right, right. Uh, and that was leaked on YouTube as well. Yep. Yeah, so, so all of this all of this contributes to the buildup, and then on the 20th, um, Erdogan goes and blocks YouTube, I'm uh, sorry, blocks Twitter, not YouTube, although that could be next. This, but he goes ahead and says the greatest thing first. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, this quote, we both, we both put this in our, in our blog post that we wrote about this for our organizations. Twitter and so on, and this is a translation, I'm sure, so it's, I like, I really like the, um, the, the particular nuances of this translation twitter and so on we will root them out the international community can say this or that i don't care they will see the power of the turkish republic that's right and like and what what a statement <laughs> <laughs> well so this is this is why i wanted to bring up the syria instance right. right before we talked about this is because at midnight that night Twitter was blocked. And the way that that blocking happened was just hilariously ineffectual. So what ended up happening was that um, users within Turkey who tried to go and access the Twitter website at twitter.com were redirected by their local ISP, their internet service provider, to basically a a splash page that said that um, Twitter had been blocked and listing the four court orders that were relevant to that blocking. Now, why is that hilariously ineffective, Jillian? Well, because it was a simple DNS redirect, and that meant that all of the uh, all of the Turkish internet users who had been evading censorship for years, um, all they had to do was change their DNS settings. Um, and now, what, can you explain what that means? Uh, can you explain what that means? <laughs> 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 oh, I don't I don't think we have to get too deeply into it. It basically means that all you have to do is uh go into your your settings and change uh, a simple number and then you are able to circumvent censorship. Now, funny side note to that um is that uh, when I lived in Boston, I had a friend who was a high school teacher, and she said that her students, in order to get around the Facebook block in the school, would use Turkish um, DNS settings to get around it. Turkish specifically. That's really. I great. thought that was pretty great. Um. <laughs> so, it, so, but I guess the point is, yeah. is that in actuality, this was just a really, really effective, easy thing to overcome. And um, around Istanbul, within hours of the block going live, mm-hmm. people had gone ahead and and um, posted signs and oh, were spray, spray painting. Pa- yeah, spray painting. Now, I only saw like two instances of this of the or two pictures of the um, the spray-painted instructions. I think that they just went really viral on social media. But I did see quite a few pictures of people who had posted um, large poster, literally posters up on like um, – on the walls of, of of buildings in main thoroughfares, explaining how you could reset your um, your Android phone to be able to access Twitter. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I also saw great screenshots of people's um, home screens on their phone, just filled with different VPNs, um, VPN apps. Um, and so, yeah. I mean, so the a couple of things that are interesting about this. I mean, the one is that you know this was so easy for people to get around, and the re- and the, the block was so futile because. 
Turks have been living with this for so long, they're all pretty adept at using circumvention technology. Now, that's not true in every country where there's censorship. Um, you know, I've heard, I've heard it said quite a bit about China that the use of these tools are not that widespread there. Um, but mm. in Turkey, now it's hard to measure the use of this because it's not a tool. It's not like something that keeps download statistics. Um, sure, I'm sure that if they were using Google's DNS, Google might be able to provide statistics on how many people from Turkey were using that. I'm not sure if that's possible. But nonetheless, um, we don't have good statistics on how many Turkish users are aware of circumvention technology or know how to circumvent censorship. Um, but nonetheless, thousands upon thousands were. Um, Turkish topics were trending on Twitter. There was one great one where it said, um, it was a tweet where a guy from Turkey said, only in Turkey, Twitter's banned. Five hashtags about it are trending worldwide with 77% of the traffic coming from Turkey. Um <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, there is one really great statistic and, and an uh, anecdote Excellent. that I love, which is that, uh, well, more than half a million tweets were sent within 24 hours from known Turkish <gasps> users. Amazing. And, <laughs> um, but one of those tweets, and I really do love this, uh, came from uh, Prime Minister Erdogan himself. Yes! So shortly after the block went into effect, the, He's just Prime like, Minister tweeted, the Prime Minister tweeted a message of support to or a message to his supporters who presumably were not on using Twitter. Um, but but interestingly, this is actually exposing something that um, fissures within the AK party. So uh, the president of Turkey, which is a it, it is a relatively um, it's sort of a figurehead role mm -hmm. um, in in the Turkish political structure. The president of Turkey is a man named Abdullah Gul, and Gul who has generally been seen as more of a, I think of a bit of a more of a moderate than Erdogan um, tweeted shortly after the block went into effect that this was an unacceptable use of power to block all of Twitter um, in Turkey. And so uh, you have the president mm -hmm. of the country who's of this from the same party as the prime minister of the country disagreeing with the prime minister's um, directive. Now there's a lot that go, that's going on there. Um, and yeah. I don't know that we have the time to get into it necessarily, no, but, no, so I, but, go ahead. but sort of, it, but no, I just want to say in brief, you know, I think that armchair speculation among people who watch sort of the Turkish political scene have been saying for a very long time that the AK party um, has become too much of a monolith uh, to, which is, you know, it's too big and it's too enthrall to just one man. And for so, for some, for some time now, people who sort of watch the party politics of Turkey have been wondering when you would see sort of public, public breaks um, in mm. that party and, and when, if at all, or well, if there might be some sort of spin out. Now I would not say that that's what this represents, but it certainly is an interesting sort of, a um, little bit of illumination to, into the fact that there are actually active disagreements with sort of the increasing tendencies towards authoritarianism within Turkey. Not much I can add to that. Um, I'm not much of a <laughs> turkey watcher myself, apart from this. Uh, I think it might have something to do with being vegetarian. I don't know. Um, oh, I didn't. I didn't just go there. Um, so anyway, so in response to this, I, I don't know, if Catherine, if you followed up, but basically... Um, about 24 hours after this was implemented, they changed tactics. Um, and they're now blocking uh, Twitter by IP address instead. So making it a little bit marginally more difficult for people to circumvent. They can't just go in and change their DNS settings now. They have to use a VPN or Tor, or they can use... Um, the SMS version of Twitter, which uh, Twitter's policy at policy account so um, helpfully tweeted uh, to Turkish users on how they can do that. So, um, so Twitter is like you know a little nonplussed by this. They're just going to help out as much as they can. Um, and then also, of course, Tor, which I've been recommending people use. Although I'm finding a lot of Turkish users are skeptical of Tor, which is interesting, um, and I'd like to dig into that further at some point. Tor is, of course, an on anonymization uh, service yes. that. <laughs> that you can run in your browser or on your mobile phone that, um, in addition to providing increased anonymity, uh, helps circumvent censorship. Yes. Um, yeah. And it also, I mean, it slows so, down your network. It, still, it slows down your internet usage a little bit. So, I mean, I've heard that as, as, um, a point of protest from people, but also interestingly enough, the Snowden leaks, um, around Tor have had an effect on, um, what Turkish users think about it. So that's an unfortunate thing that I think we'll just have to think about and further. of course the snowden leaks about tour have suggested <laughs> that um have suggested that uh the government or that the nsa is at least attempting to um backdoor tour got it so that they can have access to your usage um so <laughs> so are you catherine's explaining me 
I am Catherine explaining you. Uh, so one thing that I think is really interesting, and I, again, all of this is really rumors and conjecture at this point, mm. but we, what I've been hearing from some folks on the ground in Turkey is that there, um, that there are sort of competing uh, projections or um, interpretations of how long this block will last. There has been a rumor that somebody is going to drop um, some additional sort of leak damaging to Erdogan or the AK party um, at the beginning of this coming week. Oh. I've, I've heard the 25th as the date. Um, again, this is all rumor. You know how rumor is on the internet, but um, that has been one of the suggestions as to why this block has gone into place and, and what they're trying to prevent from getting out. So who knows? Yeah. It could all, it could also just be punitive. Yeah. Yeah. I've so. heard, um, I've heard that. Okay. So, I mean, I, I there's still some confusion around the actual court orders. The court orders that were displayed on the block page that people got to, um, which you can actually also access by typing in... Wait, where is it? Um, we should give people this one because it's fun. Um, there's a Turkish government website. The URL is internet.tib.gov.tr. Um, and you can actually Google... Or Sorry, oh my god, I just said Google when I meant search. That's terrible. Um, you can actually search on this website... Um, any URL to see if it's being blocked in Turkey and under what order it's being blocked. And it's, those are also the same block pages that people uh, see when they try to go to the site from within the country. Um, Which is a wonderful example of transparency. Yes. Yeah. It's an interesting example of transparency anyway. <laughs> um, what good is transparency if there's no accountability to go with it? But um, the, yeah, if you look at the site, the court orders that are listed are from um, February 3rd. March 18th, March 4th, and March 7th. Um, so all quite recently. Yeah, but I, the, the, the folks in Turkey that I've talked to um, haven't been able to get dig up much data on what those court, what those, um, court orders are, what they represent. Interesting. Um, and it's not clear um, what right he had to block it in the first place. So Interesting. So one of the things that I, I know that we're running short on time, but I did just want to touch on one last thing before we go, because we've taught me, this has been a, a, you know, an unusually censorious show for us. Um, but I guess it's been an unusually censorious week for the internet. And it's true. we've, we've been hearing a lot of fears about censorship here at home in the United States, uh, particularly from some Republican lawmakers who are very, very concerned about a decision yeah. by the Obama administration um, regarding internet governance because they're afraid that that decision is going to result in the censorship of the global internet. Mm -hmm. Jillian, do you know a little bit about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so I, I can go back just uh, briefly and then, because Catherine wrote a great piece about this, so I'm going to let her shine on this one. But uh, I can go back a little bit to 2012 when there was this big debate. And we've actually talked about this on previous shows, so I won't get into it too much because I assume that it's mostly the same people watching every time. Um, <laughs> um, but there was a debate in 2012 over whether or not the internet, International Telecommunications Union um, would have increased control over... Um, regulation of the internet, and that was, you know, hotly debated with the U.S. on kind of one side of it, and a lot of civil society siding there, and then a lot of civil society from around the globe sort of in the middle going like, well, why does the U.S. get everything? And that's been kind of the um, the discussion since. There's been a lot of debate this year, too, um, and this culminating in this uh, meeting that's happening in Brazil in a few weeks, the Net Mundial, um, of whether or not, you know, governments should have the right to keep user data in their country. Um, and so this is not directly related, but it's all part of the same discussion, um, where basically, so, um, I'll just set Catherine up with this one. So there was this, there's, there's been, um, you know, like she said, Republican lawmakers, so you've got Newt Gingrich saying every American should worry about Obama giving up control of the internet to an undefined group. This is very, very dangerous. And then you have L. Gordon Krovitz, um, from the Wall Street Journal, who, he just drives me nuts anyway, but saying, um, that, uh, you know, unless the White House plan is reversed, Washington will hand the future of the web to the majority of countries in the world already on record hoping to close the open internet. So there's a lot of fear mongering. Um, and there's a lot of um, sort of ridiculous claims being made about the US as good and the rest of the world is bad. Um, but so Catherine, what is actually happening? Because Catherine wrote this great yeah. piece for Politico called No, the US is not giving up control of the internet. Um, why is that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, so no, the U.S. is not giving up control of the internet. Well, good. So, what happened? Well, no, no, no. It's really reassuring. So, about <laughs> a week and a half ago, um, the Department of Commerce um, put out an announcement saying that they were going to ask ICANN, which is the International Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, Inter Inter uh, Internet Corporation. 
or international corporation? Internet, internet corporation. Okay. Oh, did I say internet? Yeah. I meant internet. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. So the it internet happens. corporation, <laughs> the internet corporation for assigned names and numbers, they were going to ask ICANN to put forward a plan to transition the management of what's essentially the DNS system, which we've been referencing throughout the conversation probably today. probably didn't define the domain name system. So. The domain name <laughs> system, which is, is really, it's what, you know, turns the numbers that computers use um, to identify each other on the internet into the human readable domains that we enter in like bloggingheads.tv. That is a domain. This is the trans the thing that translates between our words and computer numbers. That's about it. Uh, so the department of commerce asked, I can, um, to come up with a proposal to make the management of the system more international. Now, a little bit of history. I can, um, is a, is a group that was set up about 18 years ago, um, primarily to manage this function of managing the Internet's domain name system for the Department of Commerce. Uh, the function has always been managed by the United States uh, because the United States had played such an important role in creating the Internet. Mm -hmm. And so historically, this was under the Department of Defense and the Department of Defense actually contracted to the University of Southern California. One guy managed it for a really long time. When he passed away, there was a decision that was made to both make it a civilian function and transfer it to the Department of Commerce, and then also to actually create an um, institution that would be able to manage it that was a little bit more robust in terms of redundancy than the one computer scientist who had been doing it before. Um, Talk about a so single I point of failure. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So ICANN was set up. It actually ta its headquarters are in the same building um, that has always managed it. Um, um, same building that the USC uh, function was in, um, and it has. But ICANN is already a global organization. So ICANN has offices around the world. It has a very diverse board made up of individuals from all over many different nations. It has uh, its structure includes a function that has a government advisory group that includes representatives from more than 111 different nations, um, non-commercial stakeholders, so people from academia, commercial stakeholders, entrepreneurs, business folk, and the like. Um, and it's, a, it's an extremely global um, organization. It ha can be criticized for not being as transparent, possibly, as we would like it to see. But, right. um, but so what the Commerce Department did was said, you know, I can, you're already basically handling this function in a fairly international way. What we would like to see is a formal proposal for a transition. And, and this really has scared a number of people um, in Washington and I think beyond because this is a, it's a complex subject and people thought, oh my goodness, we're handing over the internet to, to the UN, to some sort of global body. And in reality, um, what commerce is actually doing is following guidance that uh, Congress passed a resolution on um, in 2012. So in 2012, when there was a conversation going on about whether or not the UN should assume a greater role in managing the internet. Um, Congress passed these resolutions in both houses saying that Congress wanted to affirm the importance of the multi-stakeholder uh, function of governance, which is the multi-stakeholder means it has the private sector, right. ac academics, civil society, members of government, um, research institutions, all the different people and, and you know individuals that, are, that believe that the internet is important and play an important role in it. And Congress wanted to affirm that specifically because they were concerned about the fact that without a multi-stakeholder model, it could just be government governments who are involved in running the internet. So I like now, I like what you say here at the bottom, because um, you talk about, I mean, that, that essentially this is, and I, I want to make sure that, that I've, I'm understanding this correctly, but basically that like, this is sort of a good compromise. If commerce does this yeah. now, then it prevents a bad deal later. Right. So it's, it's a little, I mean, I, what I, I think I described it as a bit of a wager, but it's a really safe one. So right. what they're betting on is that by entering into this voluntary process now where they, they control the timelines, they control the conditions. So if, you know, ICANN comes back and says, here's our proposal, and Commerce is like, ah, we, not really our thing, we don't like that, they don't have to accept it. Right. Um, so they control the timelines, they control the conditions, um, the, the sort of, it's all being done in line with congressional guidance, and so we already know what Congress wants. Um, what they're betting is that this will prevent a forced takeover, if you want to call it that, of the internet later, where it might actually come down to something where a UN agency has is given authority through some sort of vote or other plenary process. Right. And once that happens, the US 
doesn't have a whole lot of options about the way that the internet gets managed. And so they're participating now as volunteer in a, this voluntary process with really you know clear control over sort of the way that it plays out. Um, I think it's a pretty good gamble. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I totally get your argument here. Um, this is not, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell that internet governance sort of makes my eyes glaze over, um, which is not to say that I don't understand, you know, it's not to say that I don't understand or the importance of it, but um. Well, so I think the really important thing, and, and what I found so so amusing about the whole thing is, is just the fact that you had this incredible political outcry criticizing the Obama administration, when in reality this was already something that had been decided as a bipartisan matter of policy. Right, but isn't that and, just and like, everybody for, forgot to go back and look at the congressional record? Forgot to, or were never aware of it in the first place? Because to be honest, I mean, I'm sorry, but like, when was the last time you heard? Um, well, okay, no. Let me let me be slightly well, fair. Apart from a tiny handful of them, when was the last time you heard a Republican who knew anything about the internet? Oh, there are, there are plenty of Republicans who know about There's the a handful. internet. Uh, I mean, I mean, I can't I say much is, better for Democrats. I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrong. say that I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that the lack of understanding the internet is a bipartisan failing. Oh yes, no, no. I mean, I'm specifically talking about by politicians. I don't mean Republicans on the whole. There are plenty of Republicans out there in this country that that do know what they're talking about. I'm talking about Republican lawmakers. Um, I haven't oh. seen much smart from the majority of them in a in a long time on the internet. Neither from the Democrats. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say. Let's say maybe lawmakers. Lawmakers. Don't I, know much I, about. I, I will give you lawmakers. I, living in DC, I would say that it's no, that sounds... a, it is a bipartisan problem. That sounds right. So. Okay, so but that reactionary lawmakers. Seem... <laughs> I guess I'm picking on the Republicans in particular because this one just seems so utterly ridiculous. This one was a little silly. Yeah, no question. So I want to leave it. Um, actually, with one thing, we've talked a lot about censorship today, and and this isn't really related to the internet, but Jillian, did you see what happened in Pakistan in the New York Times the other day? I don't know. Did I? I don't know. So we're closing out on this, but we've talked a lot about censorship online, and I just wanted to make the point that censorship offline is still a very real thing. Oh so, my god, I see what you're talking about now. So what? the New. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe um, what happened is the New York Times this past week ran an article talking about Pakistan's ties to Osama bin Laden and what they did and did not know about the leader of al-Qaeda's whereabouts over the course of the past couple of years and, and the Pakistani government's support or you know lack of support or general relationship to um, international global uh, terrorism. And that article was censored in Pakistan. And so what did the New York Times do, Julian? You've seen the picture now. <laughs> it's literally just blanked out. So the article is called What Pakistan Knew About Bin Laden. And there's just literally a giant blank spot on the cover of the International New York Times. <laughs> what? Yep. So the International New York Times, wow. uh, form formerly known as the IHT, published um, publishes all over the world. Its version that was published in Pakistan just was a Giant, all the entire sort of A1 section where you run your lead story is a giant piece of unprinted paper. So remember that um, Pew study that we talked about earlier? Yeah, what it's about worth it? noting that only about 22% of Pakist young Pakistanis um, ha support internet freedom. Interesting. It's the lowest of all of the countries polled. I mean, Uganda's That's the next at 50%. Huh, and wow. Uganda has much lower internet penetration, for the record, than, That's than Pakistan. That's re really, really interesting. Yeah, so it seems that widespread support for censorship in Pakistan. Um, this is really well, fascinating. There was, there, was, there was a pretty funny comment. I, I don't know if it, I sent you that link or not, but I think uh, maybe it was covered on Gawker that, that the New York Times had chosen to do this. And the first comment said something along the lines of, well, why would they do that? Everyone wants to know where the article is. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the 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 Times didn't do it though. This article says that the the printer removed the article without the Times' knowledge. Oh. So they said we would never sell. Uh, company spokeswoman Eileen Murphy said we will never we would never self censor, and this decision was made without our knowledge or agreement. While we understand that our publishing partners are sometimes faced with local pressures, we regret any censorship of our journalism. Okay, so I didn't know that. I thought that that was a deliberate protest move on behalf of the Times. No. Which, to, I was giving them a lot more credit, perhaps. Yeah, no. I mean, unfortunately, they, they did just try to... Well, they still deserve credit. They tried to publish the article, and then... You know, it just oh, oh, no, no. They deserve total credit for the article. Yeah. I just had, had some romantic notions <laughs> of the media, you know, going ahead and, and, ex and exposing the degree of censorship. No, uh, I think Pakistan did that one for itself, actually. Well, that's pretty brilliant.
All right. Well, it's been a really fun hour chatting with you. Yeah. Wait. Always. Can I just note one more thing about this? Oh, please. If do. Twitter, yeah. if Twitter were censored in Pakistan, we probably wouldn't have known about that story. Really so in order point. to get that story, you had to have someone in Pakistan photograph it and post it somewhere. Now, granted, they could email it to me and I could post it, but that all of that relies on international communications, which are enabled by these social networks. So just putting that and out there. all of it relies on, yeah, or and the fact that someone would have emailed it to you requires them to know that you exist. Right. Whereas they don't need to know who is receiving the information they share on Twitter. They just need to know they're putting it out And there. I know a ton of people in Pakistan, but I don't think I would know any of them if it weren't for the internet. Wow. Because I've never been there, so. That's, that's, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> all right well, um, <laughs> no debate there uh no 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 the internet really is, no debate yeah. anywhere in this program i think apart from me debating the authors of that report um so <laughs> here we go again with no debate anyway Catherine, it's been great chatting with you about all of this you too um and if you know i actually want to sort of throw it out there if there's anything that people who watch the show would like to see us talk about it'd be great to let us know yeah if you have any ideas for things that we might disagree on in particular that would be helpful you know we can we can cer certainly circle back to our discussion uh, discussion excuse me on uh gender and news startups i know that that one has has really hit the news again lately that sounds like a great topic for next time i'm happy to jump right back into that <laughs> all right it was great talking with you Julia. you too take care bye bye